We are in the fourth segment of our course, of our Bible school course for the summer, and we are looking tonight at Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. Everybody say Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. All right. Go with me for, to Judges 6, and let's pick up at verse 12. Judges 6 and verse 12. Joshua Judges 6. Verse 12, say amen if you have it already. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? The word save there literally means to help. How can I help Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. Least means youngest. And the Lord answered, I will be with you. And you will strike down the Midianites as if they were but one man. And Gideon replied, if now, everybody say now. Now. He said, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign, or literally a miracle. Give me a sign, he said, that it is really you talking to me. Anybody ever prayed that prayer? I have. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. And Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast. And putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and place them on this rock. And pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. And with the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized or understood that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. And to this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abia's rites. And that same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years older. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. It is consecrated for your glory. Let us partake of it and receive exactly everything that's in it by your spirit. For your glory, we ask it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen. All right, say with me one more time, Jehovah Shalom. All right, let me spell that for you then in the Hebrew. We would transliterate uh, transliterate this way. Uh, Yahweh, we've been dealing with that, Y-A-H-W-E-H. Now, actually, literally, originally, in uh, in the the Hebrew, you wouldn't have consonants, or you wouldn't have vowels. You would only have consonants. So actually, it would read Y-H-W-H. There would be no A or E in there. Okay, that was the ineffable name of God. You didn't speak it. Uh, you, you, weren't, you weren't allowed to utter it. And so therefore, it was just uh, four consonants put together, Y-H-W-H. But we put, uh, translators put the A and the E in there to make it available and to make it easy, uh, transliterated so we can actually speak it and pronounce it. So, Yahweh, and then Shalom is really spelled it's not spelled uh, in the Hebrew, uh, S-H-A-L-O-M. It's spelled S-A-L-O-M. S-A-L-O-M. And the S is pronounced with an S-H sound. And that's actually called a shin 
in Hebrew, uh, the grammar. And so that's a, that's a shin, so it, it says uh, Yahweh Shalom. Everybody say Yahweh Shalom. Now this takes place about 1255 B.C. About 1255 B.C., 1,255 years before the uh, opening of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So 1255 B.C. Who is the author of the book? Your, your study sheet asks for that information. Now, no one knows for sure 100%. Because there's no designation as to who wrote it. Most commentators and theologians believe that Samuel wrote the book of Judges. Some people actually believe that Gideon wrote his own story here in chapter 6. But most people believe, most theologians believe, that Samuel was the author of the book of Judges. All right. The story of Gideon begins with a graphic portrayal. And if you have time, or if I'm sure you've read it before, we've preached on it, but if you have time, go ahead and read uh, the first 11 verses in your own time, and it kind of sets the stage for what we're going to deal with here in the next few moments. So when we deal with the story of Gideon, we understand that this particular situation that we read about is a graphic portrayal of one of the most Striking examples of God's choice of what we would call an unlikely leader. Gideon says, I come from the weakest clan, the smallest clan, the most unimpressive clan, the clan of Manasseh. They were the lowest on the totem pole. And then he says, and, and, or tribe, and then he says, and then my clan is the, is the smallest or the, or the least effective uh, the least prominent clan within the tribe of Manasseh. And he says, and then let's go even more. He says, and I'm nobody. I'm the least of all of them. I'm the youngest. Er, uh, youth at that time was a disadvantage. Now it's prized. Everybody want to be young again. Somebody say hallelujah. All right. But back then, youth was not an advantage. It wasn't regarded as something of, of great value. And so he says, I'm the youngest of everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm really nobody. He says, and, and so how can I go save Israel from the hand of Midian? You're telling me I'm a mighty warrior. You're telling me I'm a man of valor. And I'm going to go save Israel out of the hand of the Midianites? I mean, he is absolutely befuddled. He's completely uh, unaware un, un, un of God's plan. He doesn't have a clue how God is going to do this, nor does he even really understand fully yet that it is God speaking to him. Gideon's a reluctant military then and spiritual leader. But he ends up, if you read the story and you continue into the rest of the chapters that deal with is with, with Gideon as a, a judge over Israel, you find that he does deliver Israel out of the hand of the Midianites. Now, the question is, uh, who were the Midianites? Well, the Midianites were desert marauders. They were a band of, uh, uh, of, of terrorists. They were a gang, if you will. They would just, they would run the desert, they would run the wildernesses, they would go anywhere they could. If there was a, 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 a people that were settled somewhere, they'd go and they'd rip them off. Devastate them, kill them. Take their cattle, take their sheep, take their, their goods, take everything they had. They were just opportunists and everywhere where they, they would go, they would take advantage of people's weaknesses. And there were, there were, by the thousands and thousands, they weren't just like, you know, 12 guys. I mean, there were thousands. Thousands and thousands of them. Now, but who are they then? They were descendants of a man named Midian. Everybody say Midian. Hence the Midianites. They were descendants of Midian. Well, who was Midian? Midian was a son of Abraham. And his other wife, Keturah. People say Keturah, it's Keturah. K-E-T-U-R-A-H. After Sarah died, he married Keturah. So they have children, and one of them is called Midian. 
the enmity, again, that builds between the children of other women, between the other nations against Israel, even though they all come out of Abraham. Everybody's trying to claim Abraham as their father. You find it even in the New Testament when the Pharisees deal with Jesus and they say, we have Abraham as our father. And I love Jesus' answer. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Ah, glory. I'm not going to preach that right now. But the reality is this, is that there was always a people group that were related to Israel, either by marriage or by blood, half brother, half, half whatever, uh, second cousin on my mama's side, third time removed. You know, that kind of thing. But every time you found them in the, mid, the, the midst or the vicinity of where Israel was, they were always against them and there was enmity and they were always trying to destroy Israel. Why? Because anything that is not directly out of the kingdom of God, the enemy is destined and determined to try and destroy it. You better realize that. You better get that in your head and understand that that's an absolute fact. These Midianites then, they're the desert marauders. They're descendants of Midian, the son of Abraham and his wife Keturah. God appears to uh, uh, Gideon and he appears to him and finds him where? You read the story up through verse 11. You find him in a wine press threshing uh, wheat. Well, you didn't thresh wheat in a wine press. Where did you thresh wheat? You threshed wheat up on a mountaintop. You threshed wheat on a, a flat place where the wind would blow and it was visible. And so you would take the winnowing fork and throw the wheat up in the air. The wind would blow away the chaff and the good wheat would fall down to the ground and that would be gathered up. That's where you did that. You did that out in the open. You did it out in public. Gideon is absolutely terrified to be in public. He said, I'm not going to go out there and thresh, thresh wheat uh, uh, in, in sight of God and everybody and all the Midianites. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to get into a wine press. I'm going to get into a place where it is least likely that I should ever be seen or discovered or noticed. And I'll go thresh the wheat in there. Nobody will ever find me in there. All of a sudden, God shows up. How many of you know God always knows where we are? And so it is that Gideon is threshing this wheat in a place that he thinks is an undisclosed location, but God appears to him there. And when God appears to him, he calls him then. He speaks to him. He issues an edict and a summons over his life. And he calls him then through an appearance of what is called, everybody say, the angel of the Lord. Hmm. It says that the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Now let me help you quickly because that phrase, the angel of the Lord, is not the same as an angel of the Lord. When you find the designation an angel of the Lord, you're talking about an angel, cherubim, seraphim, whatever it might be. But when you talk about the angel, when you find the angel of the Lord... It is talking specifically about the pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the Godhead. It is Jesus the Christ. It is the second person of the Godhead appearing in a pre-incarnate. What is pre-incarnate? Everybody say pre means before. Say incarnate. En carne. In flesh. Pre-appearance before he comes in flesh. So he comes as the angel of the Lord. He comes and he appears to Gideon. It is the angel of the Lord then that appears to Gideon and calls him and designates him as the mighty man of valor who in fact, even though Gideon thinks could not happen, he says, you will deliver Israel out of the hand of Midian. Go, I'm with you. He says, well, how can I know this is you? He says, let's have a meal. Look at what he says in the verse, uh, we go to verse um, 
uh, verse 18. He says, please do not go away till I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait for you to return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat from an ephah of flour, made bread without yeast, putting the meat in the basket, broth in a pot, and he brought them out and he offered him to him under the oak. And so it is then that Gideon prepares this meal for the angel of the Lord. Interesting that he does not eat the meal. It's also interesting when you realize that if this, and it is, the second person of the Godhead, that this is the Christ of God, this is the Son of God, who is appearing in pre-incarnate form, then you understand something as to why he doesn't eat the meal. Number one, he doesn't eat the meat. He doesn't have anything to do with the broth. The Bible says he tells him, pour it out. And then he touches it with the staff. And it becomes a flame. And it's consumed. Why doesn't he eat it? Very simply, there's two reasons. Number one, the fact that he didn't eat it was this. Here's the reason. He was showing Gideon that he was not a man who needed meat. When Jesus speaks to the disciples after his encounter with the woman of Samaria, they tell him, hey, you must be hungry. You've been fasting. You need to get something to eat. We can get you something. What does Jesus tell them? He says, I have bread, I have meat, I have food that you know not of. What was he saying? He was reiterating then, in that instance, what he had originally done here in 1255 B.C. He said, I'm God Almighty. I don't need your provisions. I am the one who brings provision. The second reason why he doesn't eat it is this. The Son of God was to be served and honored by sacrifice. Gideon brings it as a meal offering, as a sacrificial offering. He slays an animal. He goes through the process and he goes through great effort to make this meal. And God's saying, here, let's do this. Let's understand. Let's put something in motion then that I'm the God who is to be served and honored by sacrifice. When he does this, and the Bible says, look at it with me. He says, and Gideon did so, and with the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. How many of you know that was a miracle? He sees that miracle. He's an eyewitness to it. He's been there to experience that miracle miracle and there is a display then of omnipotence this is the second person of the Godhead saying I am all powerful I can make things disappear I can make things appear I can destroy should I choose I can designate I can uh, 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 tell you what to do and how to do it and then I will back up my word but you asked me for a miracle you ask me for a sign, here it is. Watch this. Watch the fire come out of a place where there was no fire. Watch fire come out of a rock. Watch fire consume everything, even after there's been liquid. Watch this take place. And then before your very eyes, I'm going to disappear. Now, I would call that a miracle. I don't know about you, but I would call that a miracle. When he does this by this display of his omnipotence, he is giving assurance to Gideon that, watch this, that he could and would consume the Midianites. The way I destroyed that, that meal offering, the way I destroyed that unleavened bread, the way that I consumed and burnt up that animal sacrifice, I'm going to do the same thing to Midian. You're going to see in this foreshadowing, he's saying, that I'm about to destroy your enemies. I don't care how powerful they are. I don't care how long they've harassed you. And as a matter of fact, that, 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 that row that had been going on between Midian and, and Israel for this particular segment of history had gone on for seven years. 
And God said, the seven years are up now. It's time. And I'm showing you that I'm the God who consumes. I'm showing you the God who can, that can, and I am the God who can and will. Gideon's response is one of terror. Look. Verse 22. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord. Everybody said the angel. Say it's not an angel. Say the angel. When Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah! He exclaimed. He cried out. Everybody say, ah. ah. That word in Hebrew there, ah, means, oh no. Oh no. He said, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Gideon's response then is one of horror and terror. For he knew, historically, that no one could see God face to face and live. He said, this is it. I'm, I'm toast now. I'm going to get consumed just like that, that animal sacrifice I just made. Dude, that God destroyed that. He consumed it. Fire came up out of that rock. Watch, I'm next. The word face to face is very, or the phrase face to face is very interesting. Because he, when he says, I, I saw God face to face. The first time we find the word face, it means this, an audience with. I saw God as though he granted me an audience. When, and I, I, please, I'm not giving any merit to this, but when people, uh, they, they say, well, I had an audience with the Pope. That's the only thing I can think of right now. That, that was a big deal. Like he granted him access into the Vatican. Or we had an audience with the Pope. Or we had an audience with a high-ranking official or the president or the emperor or the king of some country. We had an audience with him. It means you were granted access into his presence. And so he's saying, I was granted access into the presence of God. I saw him face. And then he says, to face. Watch this. Because the second time you find the word face, it, it designates purpose. It means for worship. I saw him, I had an audience with him so that I might worship him. And Gideon worships with his sacrifice. Your sacrifice is always a sign of worship. He says, I cannot live now. And God doesn't consume him. And the angel of the Lord doesn't destroy him. What does he do? He says, I speak peace to you. Look at it. He said, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. He sees the Lord face to face. He assumes he's going to die. He's going to be destroyed. But instead... God spoke peace to him. God spoke shalom to him. The word shalom literally means this. There's, there's about 600 some odd definitions of the word shalom. I'm not going to give them all to you tonight. The most succinct one is this. Everything is all right. You're not going to die. It's all right. You're not going to be consumed. Everything's all right. You're not going to be destroyed. Everything is all right. Everything is shalom. God speaks peace to him. And when he speaks it, it's not a wish. A lot of times people speak the word peace and they go, well, peace to you and peace be upon you. It's really more of a wish because they really, uh, most people uh, don't have the power or the authority to give a divine declaration or a decree of the word peace. That's a priestly function. I don't have time to go into that tonight. But the fact remains that when the angel of the Lord says it, when God says it, he's speaking it not as a wish, but he's speaking it as a declaration of victory. Hear me and hear me good. A declaration of victory about 
the enterprise in which Gideon is about to engage. I'm telling you, Gideon, that it's going to be all right. I'm telling you, I'm with you. I'm telling you that victory is right around the corner. I'm telling you not to worry, not even a little bit. I'm speaking shalom over you. And the minute I speak shalom over there, over you, you move in the direction and you move in the dimension of what I have spoken over you. Oh, God. Because it goes in line with my destiny for you and for Israel. So if I speak peace to you, walk in peace. Walk in the knowledge that everything is all right. Somebody ought to praise God just even a little bit right now there's three things that I want to give you as we close this study what are the three takeaways from this for me what am I supposed to really understand about all of this the first one is this Gideon is in a place where he expects now to be destroyed. He's threshing wheat in a place of fear, trepidation, and now that's even enhanced because now he's had a visitation from the angel of the Lord, and he figures, I'm toast now, that's it. I'm definitely done. The Midianites didn't get me, but God will. Understand this. That in the place where Gideon had expected nothing but destruction, God spoke peace to him. I want you to know tonight that in the place of your weakness, in the place of your fear, in the place of your anxiety, in the place of your trepidation, do not expect things to get worse, expect things to get better better and hear the word of the Lord come into your soul and into your spirit and into your mind for he's going to speak a word called shalom over your life and you must know that everything is going to be all right do not expect destruction expect victory the second thing we want to take away from this story is this this lesson Gideon now has a sense of security. He says, after the Lord says to him, peace, do not be afraid, you're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord, and he called it, the Lord is peace. He called the Lord, the the altar, the Lord is peace. So watch this. Gideon's new sense of security causes him to build an altar, and he calls it Shalom in reference to what the Lord had said in verse 23. He said in verse 23, peace, don't worry about anything, I'm with you. So Gideon says, hey, you know what? I'm not destroyed, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to get killed. Midians can't t- Midianites can't touch me, God's not going to kill me. So you know what? God appeared to me, this is good stuff. I- I'm ready to go forward in the name of the Lord and do what he's called me to do no matter what. He said he's with me, so I'm going to go ahead and just build an altar and call it uh, Jehovah. Shalom. Every time God ever appears to you, every time He grants you assurance, every time He speaks safety and all rightness into your life, the very next thing you should do is build Him an altar. Don't just walk away from that thing. Build an altar and say the Lord is peace. How do I build an altar? Are you going to go up on a mountain, get rocks and do that? No, no, no. You build an altar through your testimony. You build an altar through your giving. You build an altar through your sacrifice. Sacrifice something. So into the kingdom of God. Once he has done something for you, don't you leave that experience of revelation of the person and the character and the nature of God without having done something about it. God bless me. Oh, I got favor. Then do something to show it. Oh, God's been good to me. Have you been good to him? Quiet in this Presbyterian, Baptist, Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Lutheran church. The third thing that we need to take away from this story is this. The Bible says that he built the altar and he called it the Lord is peace. Watch this. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Everybody say, it stands. 
The word stands there is the Hebrew word od, od, and it literally means this, it still remains. Understand that the peace of God remains. It didn't go away. It didn't vanish along with the angel of the Lord when he disappeared. It didn't dissipate. It wasn't taken from you. It is still there today. The altar is there today. The peace of God is there today in your life. And you can access it any time you need it because it's still there today today if you got what God said tonight give God a praise stand to your feet and give him some glory in this house tonight God thank you for the sustenance and the provision of your word thank you for speaking life into us by your spirit through your spoken word through your written word through the logos made rhema and the word become flesh we thank you for it we give you glory now bless your people and we speak peace over every person under the sound of my voice. I release it in this room now. In the name of Jesus. We'll see you soon.